Welcome PsyQ community. I'm Jackie Canning from Otsuka Neuroscience Medical Affairs. In this interview, we will be focusing on another edition in our series on mental wellness across the lifespan. Specifically today, we will be focusing on youth mental wellness. Today, I am joined by Dr. Mojgan Maki. She is a physician who has earned her medical degree at the Washington University of School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. She has a private practice for child, adolescent, and adult psychiatry in Chicago and Northbrook, as well as Solutions North Shore Intensive Outpatient Program. She's a psychiatric school consultant, at multiple locations across Illinois, and a distinguished fellow for the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Welcome, Dr. Maki. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This program is paid for by Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization and in conjunction with our partner, Lumbeck LLC. I am an employee of Otsuka and Dr. Mojkin is a paid consultant. Today, we're gonna to provide an overview on the current statistics within child and adolescent psychiatry. We will highlight key issues pertaining to mental illness and wellness among youth, discuss diagnostic and treatment challenges within child and adolescent psychiatry and share perspectives as to where the field of child and adolescent psychiatry is headed. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mackey. Oh, thank you very much. I am happy and pleased to be here. And I figured that it would be good to start the conversation with talking about mental health disorders in children and youth and review some of the rates of these psychiatric disorders and look at some of the most common presentations that are specific to this age group. And perhaps if we have time, we can review a little bit about the conversation and how DSM has identified the differences between these psychiatric disorders in children compared to adults and how they have incorporated that into the diagnostic formulation for this age group. For the second part, I like to focus our thoughts on the future. What can be done to become preventative? How can we teach our children and youth to think of mental health, to think of mental hygiene, and to remind them of some of the basic skills and techniques that by paying attention to, they can foster mental health and to reduce stress. To start to talk about rates, from looking at this slide, we know that mental health illnesses do not discriminate. About 75% to 50% of adults report having the psychiatric disorders or the symptoms of the psychiatric disorders before age 14. We know that children have mental disorders. And when we compare the rates of children to adults, we basically see three basic groups. The one group that the rates increases as children grow into adulthood, such as diagnosis of anxiety or depression. The second group is the group that rates actually decreases and lowers as we go from childhood to adulthood. And those are some of the disorders such as the impulse control disorders or ADHD disorders. And the third group are the more pervasive mental illnesses that the rates more or less remains the same through life. And those would be disorders such as intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, autism, and even some of the schizophrenia and bipolar types of disorders. We know that looking at the data, about 14 to 15 million children need mental health support and need clinicians that are experts in children's mental health. And there is always a delay. We know that there is a delay of getting help and the delay is usually about two to three years. And it comes because parents think, oh, maybe it's a phase or maybe it will get better. Maybe it's a behavior problem. Maybe the child is acting out or is being manipulated, manipulative. But the more there is delay in treatment or in that initial conversation, the more difficult it will be to treat and there is more cost of mental health on the families and the burden on the public health. But I'm also not 
you know, this is not to blame the families. This is exactly why it's so tricky with children because the presentation is very atypical. A child doesn't come and say, hey, I'm depressed or I'm anxious. It's very confusing the way children present their symptoms of mental health. And that's exactly why we need the experts that are trained in this uh, field to be the frontliners for us. And I say that knowing that we have one third or one fourth of the workforce that we should have. Currently, we have 10,000 child adolescent psychiatrists in United States, which means every child psychiatrist should see about 1,600 patients. And I know that I won't be able <laughs> to do that. And no. it actually becomes worse in the rural areas. So we really need about 35,000 child adolescent psychiatrists. There is a huge deficit in the area. And we can talk later about that as we think about what are some of the areas that we need to focus for the future. Of course, I don't want to ignore the sentence of suicide is the third leading cause of death. And we actually know from some of the studies that uh, it can be somewhere between second to third leading cause of death. First being on accident, unintentional accident. And then the second and third are homicide and suicide. And depending on the socioeconomic groups, the ethnicity groups, that can range between second or third. And of course, it is death is always a devastating factor, but it's even more of a burden or more of an emotional turmoil when we see one of our youth in suicide. Absolutely. Can we move to the next slide to talk a little bit about some specific, commonly seen psychiatric disorder in children and youth? And I want to focus on anxiety and depression in this slide. And we can cover behavior problems, neurodevelopmental, and substance use in the subsequent slide. Anxiety disorders are the most common psychiatric disorders in children and in adolescents. At any time, nearly about 7% of youth have anxiety. And this is one of the disorders that we talk that the rates increases as they move into adulthood. We know that in adults, the anxiety rates are about 20%. And again, I see it every day in my clinic when I have an adult patient and we talk about childhood and I ask about, did you have these symptoms as childhood? More often I hear yes. And those are specific to specific phobias, especially as a child, you know, fear of tornadoes, weather storms, fear of bugs, fear of someone breaking into the house, and then it moves into social anxiety, separation anxiety, agoraphobia, panic disorders, and general anxiety. The medium age of onset for anxiety disorders in children is at age around 11. Anxiety disorders are usually specific to the developmental states. As you can imagine, separation anxiety occurs likely when the child is five, six, seven, and starts going off to daycare or kindergarten or the start of school. And then it moves into more of the social anxiety as they become into the early adolescent years. And then general anxiety, agoraphobia, and panic disorder into the late adolescence. Some of the ways children present anxiety is behavior such as avoidance. And when they are pushed to be exposed to the area that is anxiety, they can end up having temper tantrum, become angry, impulsive, disrespectful, have behavior problems. Or there are other ways such as somatic symptoms. Gastrointestinal symptoms are very common in children with anxiety, headaches. There is a large 
a group of children that have that show their anxiety by restriction and eating disorders. For example, they have fear of choking, and so they stop eating, and that's the primary way of their presentation. We know anxiety disorders are highly comorbid with other psychiatric disorders, particularly with depression, but also with ADHD, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, and of course, substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. We know the course of anxiety is chronic and it often is waxing and waning. And as you can imagine, but I had a good day today, so let's wait. We don't need to see anybody. It was a good week. I did really good in my summer vacation. Let's wait and see how things go in spring or in fall. But it's vax and wane. It comes and goes. And it also exhibits both homotypic and heterotypic combination. So homotypic is that it moves from one anxiety disorder to another anxiety disorder within the category of anxiety disorders. And the heterotypic would be moving to other psychiatric disorders, like the depression that we talked about. Untreated anxiety disorders can cause significant impairment in social, educational, occupational, health, and family. A good percentage of children with anxiety disorder have suicidal ideations, and about 6% of them have made suicide attempts. There is treatment, which is hopeful. There is a large body of evidence, and we have evidence-based treatment for anxiety, both in psychotherapy approaches that can provide psychotherapy for children as young as five or six. We have modules for selective mutism. We have modules for panic and general anxiety disorders. And there is also evidence-based treatment with medications. The treatment course for anxiety disorder is still unclear. But the general rule is to continue treatment for 12 months. And depending on the environment and respond to treatment and with collaboration with the family to consider lowering or tapering off the treatment, hoping that they would remain in recovery. But that would require a lot of conversation with the families. And oh, for absolutely. them to recognize that if they see the symptoms and the relapse and the reoccurrence that they need to reach out, touch base, and restart the treatment. And these apply both in psychotherapy and for medications. I want to move to depression, but first I want to hear if you have additional areas that any questions or that you like for us to talk about. So I'm curious, in your experience, what percentage of the families take an active, helpful role in, in helping these, these children and these adolescents? It's a mixed presentation, and it's not just the families needing to take active roles. It's also the clinicians providing education to the families and to discuss with them the importance of them becoming involved. So I want to say that the burden is actually more on the clinicians to engage the families and to insist that they become involved. And once the families are aware of it, you know, there are still some difficulties and some barriers along the way. Families have other children that they need to attend to. Families have their work that they need to attend to. So it's not as easy for them to be part of that therapy session. But mm -hmm. we often talk about how we can, let's suppose that we have the child in therapy once a week. You know, they're not in the crisis. This is more like an acute management, not crisis management. They're in mm -hmm. therapy once a week. We, we talk to families if they could if they could be present for the last 10 minutes 
for the beginning 10 minutes of this session, or we find other ways such as why don't we schedule every third appointment, we make it a parent appointment. So we can talk about some of the some of the things that we have discussed with the child in the treatment and also to teach the family how to find a better way and a better vocabulary to help the child if they end up with an episode at home. Wonderful. I really appreciate you describing what that might look like for a family um, trying to, to help their child. Yeah. Sometimes I ask them to even send me an email, just send me an email before my session with the child and give me a follow-up, an update on how many episodes, what's the intensity, what were some of the uh, triggering factors, and just keeping them included and involved. Yeah, really good question because that is a game changer in the outcome. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. We know depressive disorders are familiar. We know depressive disorders are recurrent. Every clinical interview I ask, I send a form and say family history of psychiatric illness. And there are times that it comes as none. And then when I have the interview at my office, I specifically go and ask about what about the grandparents, uncles, aunts. And often there is this uncle or this grandparent who suffered from depression. Even if at that time they didn't get services, mm -hmm. you hear that they had disabilities, even though the family put them together and didn't really go into uh, a higher level of care, but it is familiar illnesses, which is associated, as we know, with high level of morbidity and mortality. For the ratio male to female, children is one to one during childhood. As children go through puberty, it becomes girls end up with two times more risk to develop depression. The clinical picture is similar to clinical picture in adults, but there are some differences that is attributed to the emotional, cognitive, and social development. For example, children have more mood lability. They have more irritability. You're going to hear irritability from me for practically all the psychiatric disorders. They have more of a low frustration tolerance. Temper tantrums, Again, somatic complaints, social withdrawals, and some verbalizations of feeling depression. We have the same subtypes of depressive disorders with psychotic depression, which has the more complicated treatment and that is at higher risk for bipolar diagnoses. And these are children who have a family history of bipolar disorder or psychotic depressions. We also have the atypical types of depressions that are the ones that are more reactive. There is the increase in appetite, craving for carbohydrate, hypersomnia, and the lead paralysis. We also see the seasonal affective disorders which can become very complicated and confusing as the season tends to occur at the same time as school starts. And so it could be interpreted as, as this is anxiety or stress related to school. As someone who's from Northern New York originally, I can appreciate um, seasonal affective disorder and seeing the changes uh, amongst many people up there. So it, it is definitely something we don't always think about, especially with children, maybe with adults at this point, but um, not always with children. So I'm really glad that you pointed that out. Yes, and for me, it takes about two to three years to figure it out because more often kids don't really know or families don't really know that their child has seasonal affective. And if, I'm, if they're in clinic with me for two years and, you know, I usually do a review of the previous year and I see that looks like there were more symptoms in October, November. And so it takes a while to review that with the family and say, we need to keep an eye on this and we need to start 
looking into some of the treatments that are more specific to the seasonal affective disorders. Another area that could be missed in the adolescent depression in girls is the premenstrual dysphoric disorders, especially if there is like a dysthymia or a basic background or baseline depressive disorders. And then on top of that, they have the PMDDs a week or 10 days prior to the start of the period post ovulation. And those are the times that we see the adolescents struggle more with either depressive presentations, avoidance behaviors, irritability, uh, or mood lability. And as we know, it's important to know these factors and to think about them because there are treatment options available for these specific subtypes of depression. We know early identification and effective treatment can reduce the impact of depression on family, social, and academic functioning. And it can also reduce the risk of suicide, substance use, and uh, persistence of the depressive symptoms into adulthood. And again, there is evidence-supported treatment intervention in psychotherapy and in medication for childhood depressive disorders that we can definitely talk about it with the families and help to lower some of their anxieties that these are actually evidence-based. There has been safety studies, efficacy studies done and help them have a lower anxiety. Um, I think one of the things about COVID is that families are now so much more aware of medication and drug studies, and they kind of all of a sudden know phase one, phase two, phase three. <laughs> so that has been one of the silver lining that we can now talk about FDA approved treatments. For disruptive and conduct disorders, I like to focus a little bit on ODD, oppositional defiant disorders. So these are the kids that, you know, I get consulted on in schools or families come in and say they are, they have behavior problems and basically they talk back, they're disrespectful to the figure of authority and it occurs in two environments. So it has, it, according to DM, DSM, the environment has to be like either school and home or, you know, a third environment if they have any involvement in sports. And this is one of the areas that even some of the mental health clinicians, we can fall into thinking this is a behavior child and perhaps to think about having a counter transference. And we really need to pause and think where these behaviors come from and kind of talk about the origin of them so that we could help the child to get treatment and support. I cannot imagine any child wanting to be on timeout and enjoying it. Timeouts are really difficult for children, and I cannot imagine any child would want to have things taken away from them. So we really need to look to see what is the driving factor. And if we look at ODD, it is one of the most complex, complex mix of risk and protective factors. Biological factors play a significant role in children with ODD. Certain disorders in the families we see frequently. We see parents with uh, disruptive and conduct disorders, attention deficit disorders, substance use disorders, or mood disorders. We see exogenous factors such as exposure to toxins, nicotines, or drugs in utero. And there is even some studies to suggest some nutritional deficiencies can play a role in development of oppositional defiant disorders. Biologically, we know these children have some changes and some abnormalities in the prefrontal cortex. We know that there is some regulation in the serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, and we know that there are changes in the lower level of the cortisol and higher level of the testosterone, which also plays to this phenomenon that is under arousal, that for them to obtain the stimulation, the stimulation has to be higher 
in intensity. And we see this even in children with attention deficit disorder. So in order for them to understand that someone is upset, they actually would only see it if they're extremely upset. So they keep pushing because they really have a different way of receiving information and receiving the environment. Of course, there is a strong element of attachment disorders or attachment theories as discussed with Balby, that these are the children that are more likely in a disorganized or insecure attachment. Thinking about all these factors and then adding a socioeconomic factor to it, that poverty, lack of structure, community violence, occur happens to be another contributor to them. It really brings us to the understanding that these children need to be at our clinics very early on and they, the treatment needs to start it early because the risk factors can pile up. It's an aggregate phenomenon with them. The good news is that there is treatment for them. What does treatment look like and, and how is the family involved with these disorders? <laughs> yes, that is the challenging part of it because the treatment is actually individual therapy along with parent management training. Parent management training. You're probably going to have to tell us a little bit more about that. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. So the individual work is really to get to understand the child, understand the triggers, and that the parent management training is to teach the families how to develop a different language, how to avoid conflicts, and to provide a positive environment for the child, and to take negative consequences and to exchange them with positive rewards for good behaviors, and then to, to celebrate small successes. So, you know, we often have families that say, well, I told them if he doesn't yell or scream for the next week, he will get to have his video game for three hours during the weekend. Well, that's really difficult for a child to obtain. And it's furthermore challenging for a child with ODD to obtain. So we really have to make, we help parents to come with a treatment plan, with a behavior plan that brings success for the child. Even if it is for the next two hours, I want you to speak in a soft voice or you know, to have a more, a less aggressive behaviors. We just want to celebrate small successes. And I think Jacqueline, the, the challenge with it is that we are asking the parents to change their ways. Absolutely, and, and, I, and I feel like that is something that's a major impactful event if that is successful, but I'm curious to what the success rate is with that. Yeah, so it's um, it can be a challenge because parents are set in the way that they are, and we are asking them to change, and it is every moment of every day, they're basically being tested, whether if they're able to carry, to stay away from what their default mode was, to go into this new mode that we have introduced them. So it's very challenging. It requires significant degree of being patient with our families, with them being patient with us, and to recognize it's step by step. We have to celebrate every little success that we have and to just continue the work. So it really needs that collaborative and that kind of village mentality to come in. Mm -hmm. We would need the schools to col collaborate, which they do. Most schools have the uh, understanding of ODD. Um, and then there is also the medication factor. So when the impulsive and dysregulated behaviors are extreme, we have evidences of using medications more in the category of the mood stabilizing medications to help to lower some of the fight and flight responses for the children and to help to dysregulate them so that they could use the therapy in a more effective way. Before moving to the next 
slide, I just want to touch base on the high comorbidity rates for these children and to remind everyone that they are at higher risk, again, for depression, anxiety, substance use disorder. So it is the duty of mental health providers to make sure we screen them for those disorders often. I would, I usually do it in my clinic every year. Annually, I put, go back and do like an initial assessment to make sure that there are no new conditions that have developed. I'd like to move to the next slide to talk a little bit about neurodevelopmental disorders. This is a huge slide. Every category deserves its own separate conversation. Attention deficit disorder, learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and autism spectrum. They really have such variation in presentation, and I want to touch base on attention deficit disorder because it's one of the most common diagnoses that we see in our offices. And to talk about the symptom presentation with the inattentiveness, hyperactivity, restlessness, and impulsivity. And oftentimes, the six, seven-year-olds we see in our office are the ones that are boys and have severe, moderate to severe diagnoses and have symptoms in all the three arms. So they go off to school and they're climbing up the walls and you know they're disrupting the classroom and they're not able to wait for their turn. And so this, that usually becomes the source of referral for us. As you can imagine, the ones that end up seeking help are the ones that are less in the impulsive group less symptoms in the restlessness group, and the primary diet symptom is in inattentiveness. So ADHD, predominantly inattentive type. So these would be girls or boys who have been able to manage. They're super talented, super smart. They've been able to manage their school. They've been able to manage friendship and everything up till they get to high school middle of high school or right up before going to college, when the demand goes up, the inattentiveness becomes a disabling factor and the grades drop and then the comorbidities start occurring. The stress goes up and that's when they start feeling anxious. They start feeling hopeless. They start having trouble with their self-esteem. And that's when they come to the office with my grades drop, I feel sad, I'm anxious. And on the surface, it looks like a little bit of depression, anxiety. But then when you go deeper layers, we find that there has been inattentiveness all along. We know that there is evidence-based treatment for ADHD. And ADHD is one of the disorders that Medication is the first line of treatment. However, we also use executive function training to empower our children and our youth to learn how to organize and to learn how to manage daily life and activities based on their strengths for a more successful life. For younger children, we send parents to the executive function training so that they can bring the executive function to home to their younger ones. Substance use disorders, every so often I have this conversation with my families and with my patients. And despite similarities in physical size and what we think the abilities are, which is amazing. You know, my high school patients are just grown and they look and they talk like super smart adults and I'm so proud of them. But most adolescents don't have the maturity level on their cognitive, emotional, social and brain growth. And I think that's really the critical factors. In addition to that, there are challenges of development in adolescence. We are now formulating separation identity 
preparing for college, preparing for our own identity, talking about our sexualities, our roles in the job, marriage, and families. And with these stress factors, and the brain that is still growing, unfortunately, we are seeing more and more adolescents that expose themselves to that initial use or that feel that it's okay to use some of the drugs or the alcohol. And legalizing marijuana in some states has not helped this cause because it's now about, well, it's legal and so it should be okay. And I think this is one area that we need to really focus on, that it's not okay, that these brains are still growing. The frontal lobe grows till up to 21 for sure, maybe even 25, and for some, maybe even longer than that. And we really don't want to bring or stimulate the brain receptors with any external substance uses. We know the risk of substance use disorder in adults is increased when their first attempt is in childhood. And, you know, I think this is one area that we really need to talk about preventive measures and to bring the conversation to schools. Marijuana is the highest use in the past years, followed by nicotine and alcohol. And we know that uh, the prescription drugs, you know, there is commonly use of opioids and, of course, the stimulants. We know the risk of comorbidity is high with substance use disorders. Suicide is high in substance use disorders. And again, an area that we can perhaps have a more significant impact in prevention. We need to ask our adolescents about their substance use. They're not going to come and tell us. And, you know, I usually find myself asking the general question and then going specifics to what about marijuana? What about cigarettes? And then I hear, well, maybe once in a while. And we really need to nail down and see what this once in a while is. And some of the other things that we need to know is, are they using with friends or are they using alone? And if they're using with friends, do they have friends that don't use? So there is a lot of conversation that we need to have with our adolescents. And I think when we ask them, they usually tell us the pattern and the intensity and frequency of the use. So this is the good news, that some of the things that we were told by our parents actually (laughs) works. We just have to bring it into current and bring it into perspective for what life is like right now. One of the areas that is really commonly brought up is the social media and the time spent on the screens. The Academy of Child Psychiatry, Pediatric Psychiatry talks about one to two hours. We know that there is more use, partly because children and adolescents are doing their homework on social, on computer and on the screen. So it's important to bring healthy behaviors and fit into the current lifestyle. To talk about how some of the social media can be the time that we socialize, especially during COVID time where we couldn't send our kids to go out and about and play, but that's the outlet for them for socialization. But there also has to be conversation to make sure that we are practicing safe social media and we are aware of all the dangers that are associated with social media and all the risks with that. I want to lastly emphasize on the areas of eating and sleep. Oftentimes I hear parents talk about good food and bad food, and we talk a lot about how we're going to talk more about the intellectual ways of food, and separating food into we need to have proteins, we need to have fiber and vitamins, 
we need to have carbohydrates, we need to have dairy products to help us with our bone growth and our teeth growth. And then we can also have the sugar and, you know, the chocolates and the, those types of food. But talking about every food is good when it's used appropriately, rather than creating this guilt that some food is good and some food is bad, talking about how we have to balance the food based on our needs and based on the amount and the growth of our bodies. And then to talk about the amount of food and to talk about mindfulness of food, I think one of the areas that can be really helpful is to have family dinners and you know, have the same food that we ask our kids to have and be open as parents to explore new foods, to encourage our children to also try and explore new foods. And talk about the amount of food. We have children who don't eat enough, and then we also have children who overeat as maybe a coping mechanism. And so to talk about mindfulness around food and eating is a really important conversation that parents should have at their homes. I just want to quickly touch base on sleep. A healthy sleep with duration and the depth of sleep can really help with feeling recharged and feeling ready to go to school and being able to be attentive, not to be moody. So it's important for families to recognize and to have that structure, but at the same time to be flexible. Not every child is the same way. Some children need eight, nine hours of sleep. Some need 10 or more. Some children have the onset of sleep at 10 p.m. and some have it at 8 p.m. So we have to be mindful of that, but have the conversation with the children so that they understand the importance of sleep and they can be collaborating with us in bringing that structure that fits them the best. I'd like to switch to our next slide and talk a little bit about the future of child adolescent psychiatry. Absolutely. So there's so much going on and there, there's so much research, so many different approaches. Um, within child and adolescent psychiatry. So why don't we touch upon education? Can you tell us what's moving forward in terms of education in this area? Mm -hmm. I really am so honored to be part of that education. You know, oftentimes my parents are so surprised, the patient's parents are surprised when I say that your child has anxiety disorder. And they're surprised to know that children can have anxiety disorders. Children can have panic disorders. You know, they can have psychiatric disorders. And I think it is wonderful to see our parents involved and interested to learn more about the psychiatric disorders in children. So there is quite a lot of different communities that are involved in this education. And I know that we are all trying to find ways to make it easier to understand and provide that system of care and also help our families find resources and help them understand that they can talk to their pediatrician for further education and for, to just start the process of treatment. I'm also very happy to see such an important shift in our schools in mental health and discussions of mental health and even the, not just the school staff, but even the students are becoming more engaged to provide support and to talk about their own mental health and their own struggles and to share that in you know, magazines, in uh, journals of schools and to, to be comfortable and to really take away that stigma. One of the, the paradox of depression is silence, right? Mm -hmm. And we really need to move away from that. And we really need to talk about it and make it okay for other people to also share their stories and to 
talked for support. With education also comes, now we need services. And I think that goes back to some of the work that we continue to do, you know, as a child adolescent psychiatrist, I uh, mentor and teach medical students, residents, and they are always surprised to see a six-year-old in my office. Many of them don't have a, an idea, don't even know that there is such a field as child adolescent psychiatry. And I want to hope that in the future, in the next coming years, we attract more physicians to become involved in the field to not only directly help with the kids, but also to become a bridge to schools or become a bridge with the pediatricians uh, so that we can provide that support that the children need in different levels and different areas. Absolutely, I agree with that. Well, thank you again for such an exciting discussion. And I just wanna add, if you or someone you know is in crisis, please contact the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK, that is 1-800-273-8255, or text CRISIS to the text CRISIS hotline at 741-741. Thank you, PsychU community, and be well out there. Thank you.